trying to get more people on the task force again. Okay. We have a couple of recommendations that we We, the city council did take up one um, applicant, and I can't remember the name. It's the professor of Professor of VCU. Don Chen? Don Chen, yes. And they did not take up any other applications. They didn't receive any, or they didn't? They didn't take up any. Okay. I just want to make sure that's added into the minutes. I did ask about that. All right. So we need to amend the minutes to reflect that that uh, comment and then move forward. Which minutes would that be, Mr. Burke? That would be the minutes before we have the force uh, May 10th. It would be, I mean, it's, it's, two, it's actually two sets. There's two sets here. So is that yes. the last Oh, okay. So let's yes. Okay. Is it May or June? June. June. Okay. So we'll make a note, notation on that. Thank you. Are any other comments on that? Hearing none, the minutes are approved. Um, we thought we would start today with the transfer station because that has been a topic of many conversations for many years. And I thought we thought as a committee it would be good to get some idea, uh, an update on what's going on and so that we will have an opportunity to put it into our thought process as we move forward with this uh, task force study. Mm -hmm. So uh, I'd like to welcome you here, Mr. McNally, Thank you. and I uh, look forward to your presentation. Very good, and I'm going to make it fairly brief, and I'm going to move quickly through it. So uh, uh, if you run, want to interrupt me any time, just do so. I'm glad to answer your questions. I'll answer your questions then. I, I think it's important to understand where we are now with the status of the project to understand a little bit about our needs and purpose so bear with me on that and uh, some of you may have seen this or parts of this presentation before so uh, that's where I'm going to start the, t today's presentation as well and, and by the way I'm, I'm project administrator and director of engineering construction for GRTC. Why Transfer Center in Richmond is uh, many of our riders transfer, uh, GRTC provides about 40,000 trips per day. That averages out to be about 10,000 transfers per day. So 25% uh, of those trips are all transfers. We, uh, at a transfer center, we'd be bringing in approximately 700 buses a day with approximately 90 buses per peak hour at a two-hour period, so it would be 180 buses during a peak period, which is usually lasts from about 6.30 to 8.30 a.m. and then from about 4.30, uh, 4 .30 to uh, 6.30 p.m. Uh, each day. The operation hours of, of a facility like that would be from 5.30 a.m. to 1.30 a.m. that same day, the, the next day. What this slide shows, I'm sorry about the uh, size of the slides, hopefully it's something with handouts can see a little bit better. What this really shows you is our current existing transfer activity, it's on Broad Street, and we're, we're, the, we're the ones causing that congestion, a lot of it on Broad Street with our buses that line up, and you can see one of them even sticking out into the street on this upper slide on the right. Uh, we take up sometimes 250 feet along a storefront. We get a lot of complaints from store owners about us taking up so much room on the storefront. Of course, that reduces their potential for parking. Uh, we have a lot of people, as you can see, congregating on the upper left-hand slide at, at one of our shelters, and they're waiting for transfers. Sometimes they work; they wait 20 to 30 minutes for a transfer activity. Uh, our goal in the transfer center at a single location is to make that a seven to 10 minute wait.
purpose and need of the project in NEPA. Na uh, NEPA is National Environmental Policy Act. It's a federal compliance act. And CRTC receives funds for programs as well as for, for our uh, buses is that we have to comply with the National Environmental Policy Act. And that's an omnibus act that was passed, uh, thankful to the Nixon administration back in 69, that really comprises of about 22 federal laws and statutes, such as, um, well, zoning is not really one of those, but such as wetlands, endangered species, cultural historical issues, and resources. Uh, sound, you know, noise, things of that nature that we have to comply with, Clean Air Act, et cetera, are all sub-acts of the Omnibus NEPA. The NEPA itself requires us to go through a documented public process, and that public process is uh, it's pretty much dictated on how we follow this. This whole project is very heavy in the process side. So we have to comply with all these processes on the federal government in order to, and gain their approval, in order to move beyond a 30% level of, of, of any major undertaking or major project. So right now where we are, at, we are at, we are at a little bit less than about 5%. So we're very early on in this project. And, uh, and you can see as I go through this is uh, what our process will be. But, uh, Key to, to getting FTA approval and sign off on one of these projects, we went through this through our uh, facility project as well a few years ago, is uh, getting approval of the NEPA and having FTA sign off on our communication plan, which, in, which is basically a public engagement plan. So how are we going to do that? What, we've, what we have in our plan is that we, one form, well, we have formed a uh, steering group, steering committee, made up of multiple discipline professionals in transit and our engineering fields, economic development, that representing Richmond, Henrico, Chesterfield. And also is we're shortly be forming a stakeholders group. The stakeholders list is actually the list that we received from economic development department here in this office. Also we'll be simultaneously with the uh, with the stakeholders group we'll be holding or starting to hold multiple meetings with the general public and that the kickoff of that will be a scoping, a public scoping meeting, and that's yet to be scheduled. Is it possible to see that list of stakeholders from the economic development department? Um, I have that now and sure. Sure it is, and, and I'm sure economic development make it available. I'll make it available if you give me your email addresses. Thank you. Uh, and that may change, okay? Because it's stakeholders. The definition of stakeholders is is uh, industries, businesses, institutions, uh, individual citizens uh, who may own property or may be living uh, next to adjacent to a potential site. So our focus area for the transfer center project is between Lee and Canal Street and 14th Street over the Belvedere. So you can, that's the downtown area. So depending on what sites come out during this public process is that that stakeholder group could change or have some, some other focus. Um, so our purpose and need is uh, along Broad Street, like I mentioned already, we we're creating a lot of congestion there. We have inadequate pa uh, passenger amenities, definitely lack ADA facilities along the street. Uh, we congest the sidewalks. Uh, there's no co uh, customer service presence at all uh, along Broad Street. And you'll see it in a few minutes. I'm going to show a, a map of our on-offs and our transfers. And you see why we're focusing on the downtown area. Um, inadequate driver amenities, service deflation along Broad Street, or certainly the perception of that. Uh, we create transportation pressures, uh, particularly about from about 4.30 to 6.30 along Broad Street. Uh, and safety and security at the bus stops is, is might be a uh, negative perception with store owners would see a group of people out there they don't know if they're motoring or if they're actually just waiting for a transfer. Uh, and then um, we have a number of people that end up crossing the street trying to catch their bus and that's a little bit unsafe situation as well. 
Sorry again about the slide. Next time I'll have bigger, larger blow-ups. What this indicates, this is actually from the VRT study that uh, Larry Hager from our office developed in. The square up there is focused in on the area where we have most of our transfer activity along Broad Street, and that's uh, pretty about 2nd to 9th Street. And then again, there's a, there's a smaller location of transfers that happens along Main Street from about 7th to 15th Street. Uh, but those on and offs are, a lot of those are transfers, and along that seven mile spine of the proposed BRT, there's 17,000 um, transfers that are, are, are uh, on offs that are occurring on any given day with the folks of those in our uh, downtown area along Broad Street. Project Gold, um, what this image shows you, I was just down in Charlotte and in uh, Durham, North Carolina. The top images, and I hope you can see these better in the, in the uh, handout, is that the top images are a uh, very nice and handsome architectural uh, building in Durham. And the lower images, I believe, are in Tempe, Arizona, and these are transfer centers. Uh, one of the problems that, that faces GRTC with all this is that a lot of folks out there have images of a transfer center being the Greyhound station over across from the Diamond. And as you can see, there's good architecture that's being built and developed for these projects. And uh, I was down in Charlotte and Durham to take video interviews and then, and then also take still shots is with them developing that into a video so that I can show it to groups such as you. Uh, won't be ready, however, until about August 9th, your next meeting. Uh, project goals, improve system efficiencies. Definitely economic benefit from the transfer center. Uh, look what happens when they develop a, a transfer center or a station along uh, Dulles Corridor in Northern Virginia. Potential for redevelopment of the current on-street transfer site, that's between 2nd and 9th Street. Uh, improved supervision of on-time performance, where we would have all the buses come into a single location so that we can either do a pulse or some of the time release of buses. Um, allow for coordinated scheduling, provide off-street location for vehicle layovers, and reduce congestion on Broad Street. So our project opportunity here, and our purpose statement, is to locate, design, and construct an efficient operating mobility center that uses alternative energy and LEED. Is LEED certified, safe and secure, and it creates and supports economic and downtown revitalization efforts while also providing a local multimodal transportation hub. So what we envision for this is this is just not for buses. This will also involve some EV vehicles, some electric vehicles, charging stations. We'll also have uh, lots of storage there for bicyclists to uh, be used by pedestrians. Uh, zip cars is also in our program. So we hope to have, yes sir. Um, it, 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 when you say multimodal, are you also planning to include um, train service? Like connections to Amtrak, or also possibly incorporate um, connections to Greyhound and Bus as well. Those are currently being handled at this facility. So what this is, this is, which is really kind of a regional response to those needs, is being done right now at this location. So what we're proposing is our our, our local response to GRTC's needs and to the need of our bus patrons as well as the other modes of, of transit that are being developed in the city. So the uh, characteristics of uh, uh, these shots are in uh, uh, Tempe, Arizona. Again, characteristics of the downtown transfer center. The routes connect at one location. It's sized to handle a large amount of bus pedestrian traffic. Access, egress on at least two sides is required. Uh, designed to support rapid movement of riders in and out of the facility. When I developed the, the video, you can really get a feel for how fast that occurs. Seven, and actually in, in Durham, their uh, wait for a transfer was five minutes. 
designed to support the rapid movement of riders in and out of facilities, support multimodal connections, strong security and maintenance components. And that's something that that was uh, uh, always been brought up in different presentations to us is the need for strong security and absolute uh, no tolerance for, for lack of maintenance. And when you go to these other facilities, is that you see that. Of course, they're, they're heavily used. Uh, Charlotte has outgrown their facility. They have a uh, 300 bus fleet. I think ours is about 165 in that range. So they've outgrown their facility and they're uh, considering building a, uh, a, that they're calling right now a Grand Central Station type of facility, which does uh, offer more multimodal with their, with their trains and uh, commuter rail. Okay. But they have transit police there as well, uh, but they also have strong funding sources. They have, a, I, I believe, a half cent parcel tax or sales tax. Yeah. Our, uh, the next page, our primary program for the facility calls for 14 to 16 bays. Uh, the facility size would be about 7,400 square feet and offer some of the amenities that are brought up before that are lacking on our Broad Street transfer locations. And we're looking for a site size of one to two acres. What, we, what, we, excuse me, what we've done so far is that we formed a steering committee. And like I said before, the steering committee is made up of about seven, well, it's 14 people on it. It's about seven city employees representing different different departments, uh, of course, traffic, economic development, public works are very key to, to this going forward. And then we also had representative from uh, Chesterfield and from Henrico, both uh, traffic engineers, transportation planners. And that was because we do offer service to Henrico and we have express service in Chesterfield. So we wanted to be as inclusive of this group as possible. And then, of course, GRTC uh, staffers, myself and Larry Hagen, who's a, uh, our director of planning. Um, and was, so we developed... Was, um, was Victoria Badger on that street? She was, yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, Jane Farrar from the city. Uh, Vicky was on the committee as well. And anyone from the MPO? The, um... Yes. Yes, Bob Crum was on the, there as well. Okay. I'm sorry I didn't mention that. Uh, so that committee... Uh, the steering committee developed site scoring criteria. And it's really kind of the typical things that you would think when you're looking for a property. Is in this, uh, you know, relative location, uh, GRTC operations. Yes, I can read it a little bit better. Um, site size, land configuration, access, traffic impact, intermodality, economic <coughs> development opportunities, environmental issues availability of course and zoning issues and based on that and I, and I have a, a greater definition of some of these and you'll notice on some of these like the uh, site size lane configuration um, access uh, and there's a couple of those that are pass fail requirements and so when you start looking at properties if they don't meet these basic requirements under a pass fail they don't make a cut for further consideration so what we did was we uh, this, this happened actually last spring. Come in. Thank you. And uh, I got with our consultant team, who is Wendell Companies, uh, and uh, with their staff, and I have one staff person and myself, and we walked all the project area, and we only used one criteria as a beginning on this, as just to start the conversation with the steering committee. And that was a one or two acre site. So you can imagine what's downtown on a one or two acre site. That made our list. We ended up with about 17 properties to consider that we then applied our site selection criteria to. Now remember is that we're also going to go through two other legs that's supporting this project for, that will end up with a locally preferred alternative. That's the goal of the DEPA process is that hopefully we'll have a site selected that we can do our due diligence that's required on all these sub laws under the NEPA project. Of course, we don't want to do them on all 17 sites. We want to be more effective with our dollars. Mr. Now, I'm sorry to keep interrupting you. If you want to hold my questions, I can to the end. But you said earlier that the study was restricted to 14th Street. 
No. No, the study area, it's, it's the downtown area. It is bounded on one side by 14th, bounded on to the west side by Belvedere, and then to the north, it's, it's Lee, and to the south, it's Canal. But is, so, is so 17th, 18th Street, this area is actually outside the downtown area? It's for the, for the purpose of our project, yes. And why, who determined that? It was, it was really determined by, and here are the locations of the 17 sites that they came out, and hopefully you can see them a little bit better right. in your handout. But, um, this was really determined by our transfer activities. And that's why I showed the earlier slide of where we have most of our on-offs and our transfer activity is occurring kind of between 2nd and 9th and then again between 7th and 10th. And it's, it's difficult to see on that, but that was a study that was done from our BRT. Right. So that directed us, of course, to focus in this area. And then GRTC, the, the overall system itself is a spoken wheel system. And so uh, as City of Richmond being major job and employment generator, is that everybody comes into that center and our, and our routes spoke out from that for revenue service. I, I just, I'm just trying to understand, and I, I, like again, I don't mean to interrupt your presentation, but uh, why it didn't consider this area, 17th and 18th Street? Again, most of our transfer activity occurs in that focus area. Right, but there seems to be some transfer activity just outside of that area to the east here on Main Street. If I look at there the, is. the purple blobs. <laughs> there is, yeah. but it, it's still not a concentrated enough for us to include that area. Uh, so, is that uh, also is I want to mention that uh, 2008, we tried to do this project before uh, here at Main Street Station, and that was here in this area, and right. we went through a similar site selection process at that time, and we were not successful. So right. now we're we're going back and refocusing our efforts on the downtown, what we describe as our downtown uh, prime area for our transfers. I'm just trying to understand where the, where who determined that. I understand what you're saying in terms of criteria. I guess I'm trying to say who had the ultimate authority as far as what the study included. GRTC. Okay. Yep. Uh, so um, and the red highlights. Uh, there's 17 sites. We ran that through a matrix of all the selection criteria, and we've now got it down from the steering committee to five sites. And those five sites, I'll briefly tell you where they are. And um, remember, this is still going through the next couple of legs of this process. I will soon, soon start leading the stakeholders through a very similar type of selection process to get to the locally preferred alternative, which also includes a study of a no-build alternative. So the sites are, uh, there's three sites down on canals, uh, just uh, either that or they border onto Cary Street from about 3rd Street and 4th Street, and then 5th. There's one site that's number 17 site on the list that's at the corner of 7th and Canal. And then there is another site that's uh, just south of the uh, center stage, which is between Grace and 6th Street. What's on Grace is between 6th and 7th Street. Is that, is that meet the criteria earlier about having two sides access? Yes. Okay. Um, a slope site uh, is leads a, uh, gives us a, a different opportunity for a, for a structure. It gives us an opportunity for a two-level transfer right. situation I'll, I'll instead about of a Street. single level. I was thinking about 6th and 7th on Grace. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's a 30-foot drop that's diagonal across that property, so that leads us to uh, potentially a concept of a, of a two-level transfer center. Okay. So what we've done so far is we've got it down to that. And what we did then is we took this is, this is extremely conceptual, well, it's a little bit more than that, but it's only about 5%. And what this was done is done for about a year ago when we were looking, uh, uh, focusing closer on the 6th and 7th in Grace. And, uh, but what this really does is give you an image of, 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 these, of these sites, 
It's two, three, five, six, and seventeen on the on the on the site uh, plan of the downtown area. And so what we started doing is we took our program and we started looking at fit, fitting our program into these different sites. And that's kind of where we are now. Is uh, the next step? Let's see. Two, three, five, six, and seventeen. Number six is the uh, race and six and seventh site. And what, what this shows is just shows that our program could work on either on, on all these five sites that we ended up with. Yes, ma'am. Could you tell me how many acres are in a city block downtown? Oh goodness, I can't. So most city block city blocks in the city are about three hundred by three hundred, which is ninety thousand square feet. An acre is forty three seven sixty. One of the issues that you look at when you look at the city blocks is that site assembly is extremely difficult in the downtown environment. And so many of these blocks are been subdivided. You might have six to ten owners, uh, you know, subdividing a, a block depending on, you know, where it is. Uh, you may only have two or three. So site assembly is extremely difficult for us to do. We don't have power of eminent domain. Uh, so uh, we have to work with owners to try and acquire properties. And it just stretches that process out even further when you get into site assembly issues. So our test fit, uh, the, one of the last pages on the handout is it shows three examples of different test fits that could work. Uh, for us again with our program of 14 to 16 bays and then two of these here to the right the middle one and one to the right corner those are uh, two level uh, transfer <coughs> programs and then finally just to wrap it up is our next steps is uh, uh, continual communication with our steering committee uh, stakeholder committee development which is basically where I'm at now um, I need to get this in front of City Council either informally or through the Land Use Transportation Housing Committee uh, and uh, start doing our public outreach. We have a public scoping meeting that is required. There's one other one on here that, that's not being shown. That is I have to meet with FTA. Uh, our federal oversight agency is uh, Federal Transit Administration. They're located for this region in Philadelphia. Victoria Badger presented a um, multimodal study to the Land Use Committee already in June. It looked like it had some had a, a site already picked out for one of its maps. I just didn't. I wasn't sure how much of this was in her multimodal study. I'm not either. I have not seen that. Okay. I'm unaware of that. Other questions? Well, you've uh, looked at the, like Charlotte or Durham or any of the uh, other cities where these transfer stations have gone into place. Have any of these localities had a change in their operating cost from these transfer stations being built? It's driven by location. They have, some of, some of them have come down by bringing it into a center location. Some of them have increased. It, it, it totally depends on how they, how their operation runs and the location of that for their routes, as it will for us. One of our pieces in our program is that as we near site selection or local deployed alternative, we'll do an analysis of our operational cost. Uh, to see how that, what routes will change, what routes will need to come in there versus the cost and deadhead hours of those. This this plan is precepted on the idea that GRTC has a spoken hub system. If downtown had, um, and the inner city had more of a, a circulator, frequent circulator, um, how would that change these plans? Well, the, the sites that are located down along Canal, Cary Street, those are going to most likely require a circulator 
off the BRT. The BRT is, is, will run down Broad Street. So how do you get folks down there four blocks south of that? It's going to require a circulator of some kind. And other cities have, have asked that same question, and they've solved it by having a free circulator. Uh, Charlotte, I was just in Charlotte on uh, Monday, and their system's called the Frontier. It's, no, it's called the Gold Rush. Gold Rush is a free shuttle that operates only in that downtown area. Well, I've been looking at, the, at Raleigh's R-Line um, as an example. They only have two buses, but they've managed to do just the downtown footprint. And mm -hmm. I think, you know, if Richmond has a bigger footprint for its circulator, one that actually serves more of the surrounding area, including, say, the museums on Boulevard, mm -hmm. I imagine that would include more buses. Most likely so. How, in order to get the time of your sequences, you know, the down on that loop, you'd want to put more buses on it than, say, two or three. So, say that again? In order to, to less or reduce the amount of time on right. a given route for a circulator, of course, you'd put more buses but on it. But how would that affect, the, say, the, the, the transfer station? I mean, you'd have more buses we on the circulator. We'd have to look at an operational you know, plan of that and, and detail it out. And, uh, it may not work for a transfer center to include those in, in a circulator. Again, it is location driven. <clears throat> Other questions? If, um, if there was a move towards increasing the study area to include 2008 footprint, which included this area, um, how much would that affect? How, how do you, how rough, I know this is a pretty rough question, but if you included the 2008 study, included this area into, into the current GRTC study, how would that affect planning? Well, the, uh, the transfers that are occurring in this area, those would occur at a single location at the transfer center. So any transfer activity happening over here in Chaco Bottom would be relocated to that transfer center in our focused area. Again, there's not a, that's not the core of, of most of that activity that's taking place. So all transfers would be in that single location. Yeah, I'm, I'm asking if that, if that if the transfer station was down here. It was actually where well, there was a possibility of the transfer station being here again. We're not considering that. We're that's not in our study at all. Right, I, I realize that now. But if there was a movement towards adjusting the study to include, I can't answer that. Okay, it's not it's not what we are considering. Okay. I guess another way of asking the question is is you've made a conscious decision to use a certain geographic area. You go through it. How would it, at this point, if, if you go through this process, who will tell you whether or not they, they believe that this area we're talking about was the correct area? Would it be city council? Will it be uh, a transportation body? Uh, what would be the mechanism to say we want to see a change? Mm -hmm. Expand your footprint. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure. The, uh, the data and the demographics that, that we've collected on transfers do not support it being out of that area. Okay. And that's, I mean, <laughs> I hate to keep repeating the same thing, but, well, but I would have to see other justification. Well, if, if maybe, I'll give you an example, maybe a, uh, a corporate entity would step forward down in this area and say, I've got a property that I'm going to offer up and let's, let's bring that into the study and maybe we can do a joint development or something to that effect on it. Then, yeah, okay, we'd have to maybe consider that. But again, it has to meet the site criteria on a number of levels before, you know, we put it through the same criteria. And if it, if it didn't pass those, then it would be out the door too. It just, just wouldn't be supported by our, our program. I'm just wondering, you know, I mean, this area's use changes with increased passenger rail and Amtrak use, if that would... It's currently that. served now by our routes. Is that correct? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
the next uh, series of questions I have, we have this study going on. You're in the process of making some presentations. From this point forward, how much time will it be before you believe you'll get into from the report study discussion to a site selection, to a design, to mm -hmm. construction, to actual implementation? Great question. Sure. Uh, we hope to have site selection done by the end of August. I don't know if we will make that timeline because there's a, there's a lot of public process that needs to occur. Okay. Uh, we hope to be done with the NEPA document, which by the end of the year, by the end of December of this year. Again, that might be pushed out as well. Uh, we learned some lessons on the first go around at Main Street Station. We're trying to be careful and apply those to this process. Uh, so that might reflect in, in some expanded time off that schedule. At that time, if it's approved by FTA, is we would get what's called a, a finding of, of no significant impact, and so a FONSI. So that would allow us then to, to move from 30% to 60 to 90 to 100% design. So that process would take about a year's time to develop finally into a, a CD or construction documents. Now, another <coughs> element on here that, that's, that will definitely delay that timeline is going to be funding. Is uh, the facility that, that we designed and built for GRTC on the south side of town took us six years to get the funding for it. Uh, currently, we don't have construction funding. We have, and it's because <coughs> we, we have Grants, we, we use federal grants for all our capital purchases and programs, projects. So those are competitive. It's an election year. So we don't have any luck getting additional funds. I'm not sure. But we have to pursue that. And uh, it's all paid for with grants, uh, usually 80% mix of federal, 20% of local and state funds go into these capital grants. Is it 80% federal? 80% federal. How much is the project? We're estimating 30 to 35 million. And, and that, that number is floats a little bit depending again on location and us being able to acquire a, a site. Yes, sir. Is there any tenant space you would have in something like that? That's a great question. That's a very good question. Um, one of the, the couple of things that we've been doing is uh, we partnered with, uh, as myself and, and our consultant Wendell, partnered with a senior communication class from VCU, and we had them look at some different questions that we posed to them, such as what is the connotation of a transfer center name? You know, what is, you know, we wanted them to go out and research in different cities a comparable size transit fleet and comparable demographic or, or population. And they came back with that for every one of these transfer centers, there is, has always been an economic development piece. So, and many times they're not the driver of that. They are secondary to it. Sometimes they are the driver of it. I'll use Durham as an example. Durham's facility is stuck right in between two blocks away from either side of, uh, I believe it's Leggett and Merritt, may have that backwards, old cigarette warehouses, very much like what we have, the tobacco roll. And then the other side of that is, is uh, Lucky Strike, one of the nicest redevelopment projects you'd ever want to see. It's beautiful. So uh, that's a great combination of opportunity. But their original master plan, they were uh, expecting to build retail space along with their transfer center. And that's indeed what we're considering as, as part of the redevelopment. Uh, basically, a, uh, we can't spend federal dollars for that build out, so, uh, but we can buy sites and we can offer soft costs such as engineering costs. We can pay for all kinds of infrastructure costs, but we can't build out those particular private lease spaces unless they are directly supported by a transit use. And so, sir, you would be JVing the deal with the developer? 
There's a possibility. There's project delivery. We haven't really discussed that much, but there's a possibility of a joint venture. Uh, FTA allows joint ventures. Okay. Uh, they've done a number of them. Uh, there's uh, Northern Virginia is probably some of the best examples of that. Uh, where they've even allowed use of federal capital funds, with this, which are the grants, on leases, which is not the way it used to be. So leases are all operational dollars usually. So they realize there's a different environment out there. They have to be more flexible, and so that's starting to occur. And, and in fact, uh, we have on the horizon for this project the potential of partnering with a uh, corporate entity, which I don't want to mention at this time. But there's a possibility that could happen, and, and uh, we're researching that now. And if that does, I mean, that's, uh, that's, that's great. But we're definitely considering redevelopment and economic impact activity with the development of the, of the site. Right. Any other questions? Mr. McNally, thank you. Thank you very much. Appreciate um, it. Does everyone have a, my business card? I'll just leave some of them here at the end of the table if you want to grab one. Subcommittee reports. Just where you want to get started? Um, just, yeah, just a second. Um, <coughs> all right. Um, user Services Subcommittee met at 3:30 p.m. at the adjourned at 5:15. It was mentioned that um, that, um, that because of what we were trying to do, what what I had planned to do, you know, was going around asking employees and stuff like that that I, I couldn't do that unless I had gotten clearance from you know from upper management in the first place. So I had to cancel the tour, you know, on the, for those purposes. Okay. Um, so we basically stayed in the office, we talked about funding issues and basically what they what they've been saying was is that they don't have the funding. That they need the funding first and foremost before they can do anything. I'm just gonna go ahead and read that's fine. All right. Frank, and I, I couldn't get, he never mentioned his last name. He's, um, um, I believe he was the president of the union. Tunstall. Frank Tunstall. Okay, thank you. Yeah, he, um, the um, president of the union. He, um, he mentioned that the main issue with GRTC is the lack of dedicated funds. And that union went two years without a negotiated increase and that the things and need to be done to improve GRTC can't be done without the funding for it. I propose that half of the revenues generated from the mills tax be dedicated to transit, and I also propose that the recycling fee on public utilities for those that don't recycle be used as funding source for transit, and that customers, you know, should be able to contribute some, for, um, like a certain amount through their um, utility bills, like on their utility bill, for example. There will be a question asking, would you like to contribute X percent of your bill towards GRTC to help fund service, yes or no, and then if, if they approve, then go ahead and, and, and take that out. Um, and then Scott proposed using revenues from the emission tax and mentioned that the recycling fee on the on utility bills is part of a contract with Central Waste Virginia Waste Authority, and I guess that would kill my um, my idea. I also propose that we um, that the that, you, that the city's rainy day fund be tapped into temporarily to help GRTC expand service in the city, and that a one percent voluntary transit tax be enacted by voter referendum. And Elridge Coles mentioned that in order to provide the routes in certain areas, the GR, that TC needs to buy in from the local jurisdictions and being served in the um, funding for it. Okay. Any questions? Well, the tax stuff is kind of out there. <laughs> I mean, we did talk about that. I don't know how how it, how involved that was, but yeah. <clears throat> I mean, because the main idea I had was we use existing tax sources or we use voluntary tax sources in order to 
we generate the dedicated funds without having to impose any new taxes. Because like it's, the last thing that anybody wants to hear is you have to pay another tax or tax increase or something like that. So I was looking at, we were looking at original, the sources that are already there that could be tapped into, you know, to generate the funding for it. All right, um, I'm going to go into the route optimization. I propose that the, um, the Route 101 be extended to McGuire Veterans Hospital, and that be a time to connect with the 62, the 70, and the 71 in order to accommodate those with physical disabilities. I also propose that the 72 run its own separate route from the 73, and that the buses be and that buses be added to the 73 to create a more consistent rush hour schedule because as I mentioned in the previous meeting, you, you, know, you currently have to wait 40 minutes during rush hour, basically, between 18 to 40 minutes during rush hour for a 73 bus. You know, when all the, all the other routes are, you know, you have less than 20 minutes. And so I think if adding resources would be, you know, would make the rush hour schedule more consistent. Uh, Bell Rich mentioned that there's nothing along Commerce Road that was my proposed routing for the 72 that would justify running buses along that route. I mentioned that um, the study done by Dr. Jimmy Chen concluded that there are several underserved corridors in the city, a high percentage of ridership lives in poverty, and that local governments should come together to expand service. Scott mentioned that um, Dr. Chen's study did not mention if VCU planned to contribute in front of DRTC and that the question needed asking. The bus trans rapid transit was discussed. If I may, back up. Yeah. Why would VCU contribute any funding to GRTC? Well, I think the question about how to improve the service is going to come down to a lot of funding issues. And we've talked a little bit already in this task force about the need for partnerships possibly with VCU and U of R. Now, we talked about at the macro committee after this subcommittee meeting that it looks like VCU and U of R are contracting with Groom. That's correct. Yeah. And so, I mean, that might cut that off. Um, but Dr. Chen is from VCU, and so I thought it would be an interesting question to ask. You know, other cities, that's what happens. A lot of universities help pay in to the transportation needs. Um, but they also have ridership coming from their students. Sure. Okay. I mean, we see a lot of commuting students still at VCU. Okay. They take up a lot of parking in the fan and elsewhere. So I think it's a I think it's a right question to ask. And I do have a question about the groom contracting. I'm not even sure. Is the, you know, I, if you're, if any of y'all from GRTC can answer this, I'll, I'll, I'll like to answer. If is the groom contracting a permanent thing or is this just a temporary thing until classes resume you know back to normal to my knowledge um, I'm not sure how long they're supposed to uh, do that contract okay to my understanding was GRTC was doing these contracts on an annual basis so I'm not sure how long they negotiated okay all right, continuing on, um, Frank proposed that the BRT be tested with first with regular buses before it implemented. I agreed, and so did Irene. I mentioned that the six already runs like a limited stop route as it is now and can be improved by passing a yield to bus ordinance and installation of signal priority devices which hold green lights until the bus crosses on all buses. And Scott mentioned that the BRT is a different type of service designed to attract cho choice riders. I, yeah, I essentially disagreed, I think, with, with you and Irene. I think that um, the BRT is a different animal. I'm, like I said, I believe it's it's something that can be done with existing resources. The only thing that, you, that would have to be done is, you know, have city council pass the yield the bus ordinance, which will give buses the right of way when merging into traffic. And then you have, um, you install and signal priority devices that, you know, like I said, hold the green light until the bus is able to cross. And that will cut down travel time just by doing that. It's already been proven in other cities, like Portland, Seattle, 
a whole bunch of cities in Canada, where, where that's basically you know nationwide where you know, the bus ordinances are in place. Right. I guess my point is that um, in order for JRTC to take it to the next level, it really needs to increase its ridership. In order to do that, it needs to have a new image and break its model. Well, I agree, but I, I'm, I don't believe that using BRT to do that would. I don't think you could use BRT to do that. Like I said, it's already it's something that can be already done using existing resources. We don't need to, we don't need to basically do any any additional construction. You know, making more dedicated lanes. You know, tie, tying up traffic. We all GRTC already ties up traffic as is. Bad perception. You don't need to make you know tie it up even more trying to make dedicated lanes I'm not, when there's already you know. Ex Devices available. I think I think we agree to disagree on this because I mean honestly, I don't want to belabor the point, but BRT, if you look at what's been do been done in other cities, it does involve you know, dedicated lanes, making real changes in how the bus system works. <coughs> you have a you have a point. Okay. In the next meeting. The next meeting, well, um, and I meant to talk with you about that because I was informed by. Um, by Marianne, that the 31st was not available for us to use the um, fifth floor conference room. So I was going to suggest either the, between the 23rd and the 25th. That's up to the committee. I'm pretty open. The 23rd? I'll have to check and see. Okay. Yeah, I'll check the 23rd. Okay, and then um, and that and that subcommittee meeting will be dedicated to the caravan issues. There was somebody that came here specifically for that night to tell tell that person that was not this wasn't the meeting. Yeah. This is the general meeting. Yeah. User services will handle caravan, and I have to inform them. You know, once once we once we're able to get a date. Okay. All right. Any other comments, thoughts? few minutes to talk about our meeting. Our meeting was June 26th, so it was a Tuesday. Um, and just as a sidebar to that, uh, we were hosting the Paralyzed Veterans Association Wheelchair Games. Uh, we had 600 athletes from all over the nation with another 2,000 guests and family members. And a huge success of the convention was all contingent on GRTC. GRTC outfitted over 20 buses, took out the seats at the front part of the bus, but the seats in the back for the family and friends, and due to GRTC efforts, it was one of their most successful ever. Um, the only downside, of course, was that the convention started with a tornado. And <laughs> <laughs> the Saturday night banquet, if you remember, was yes. a horrific storm yes. as well. Um, my point is, a sidebar is the closing bank would finished at 9 p.m. and we had to shut down and keep everybody in for another 45 minutes to mm -hmm. the weather conditions. So they opened and ended with N plus the 100 degree temperatures. Yeah. Mm -hmm. well, I'm so, really glad your Tuesday will help. That was an excellent event. But it was it's something to be very proud of for the whole destination of the region. And the bottom line, McGuire Veterans hosted it. The GRTC made it happen, so um, just what it all did was just incredible. Um, but it, at the same time, our meeting was taking place. We had Bob Crum from the Planning District uh, Commission came and made a presentation on the next 20 to 30 year growth. Uh, did an outstanding job of what the needs are going to be of the change of the demographics. Um, we had out a grid of all of his statistics, but all in all, it was. Um, you know, it's just clearly where the future is going to be is on public transportation. And discussing the uh, transfer station, discussing the BRT is just all part, even though, you know, it's probably <coughs> six years to take the funding, but today is the first day to start asking for that funding. And, uh, it's critical, the success of the destination. Uh, also, we've been talking about how great the region is on is quality of life. And you've heard of all of these national surveys and how Richmond's the best city and, you know, um, Outdoor Magazine's going to name it 
one of the most innovative and best outdoor cities, but it all relates back to transportation and quality of life. And that's what Bob kept driving home with his presentation. So um, really a good process. Okay, thank you. Other comments? Uh, do you suggest we do another committee meeting? Yes. And that would, that would be that same slot? Same slot would be July 24th, 4 p.m. Uh, at our offices again. Yes. <coughs> okay. July 24th? Is that 4th Tuesday? Okay. Yeah. Is that good? Yeah. Okay. And you're looking at the 23rd? Yeah. Through the 25th. Either, either one of either the 23rd or the 25th, because I'm that you know knowing that y'all trying to have the other one, I'm not going to interfere with that. 25th might be a little hard for me. Well, shooting for the 23rd. <coughs> okay. All right. Anything else we need to bring up to the committee while we're here today? The task force. Any comments from anybody? I've I've forwarded um, emails and comments from from neighbors and. and People who responded um, to different posts online, and uh, I'll be happy to continue to do so. I think they're pretty important. Good. Okay. Yes, William. I just wanted to mention that if you're looking at your calendars tomorrow, we will be sending out uh, invitations to our board of directors is hosting an open house at our uh, headquarters facilities on uh, July the 26th from 4 to 6 p.m. And Marianne was kind enough to get me addresses for everybody so that you will get individual invitations. But the public will also be included. Uh, yesterday, a story, Larry was on uh, Virginia this morning, uh, and it was taped at our maintenance facility. And uh, so we will be running tours of the facility. I know some of you have seen those tours, and uh, but there will be tours open to the public and to, we will be inviting all kinds of stakeholders throughout the community. That's July 26th? July 26th. Um, I'm sorry, go ahead. John? Um, first one of these meetings I've come to, um, and I come to you asking a specific question from a specific group. The Robinson Street Association, which is just taking flight, if you will, has asked uh, if, in fact, any of these deliberations have considered taking buses off of Robinson Street and putting them on the boulevard. We have not had any conversations at this point. And who would be the perfect person for me to contact on that issue? Well, I think. Um, and let, let me. Let yeah, me, I mean, again, it, why? Yeah, well, let me let me answer it this way. It, no one has brought it to the attention of the of the ridership group, and obviously, it's the ridership group. Uh, the task that subcommittee that's looking at it to have that conversation. Okay, thank you. And that's what that's I'll what have that conversation. Hey, yeah. Sorry, if you don't mind, state your name. You're the rest, Charlie Deridor. Okay. Um, I will say that I have received comments about people wanting more north and south routes, uh, include Robinson Street. I'd also say that um, one of the considerations that we've talked about in this task force is getting politics out of the route determination, in other words, getting city council away from deciding routes altogether. Right. So. Uh, may I? Yes. Our argument um, as an association, as a fledgling association, uh, would be this, two parts. One, we think, we don't know this for sure, and probably you all do, that the Robinson Street uh, corridor for buses is antiquated in the fact that the barn used to be on Robinson Street and so they were going back to Robinson Street. Uh, agree or disagree? Don't have a okay. Don't have a point of the way. Well, <laughs> we also would ask you to take note of the speeds the buses go up and down Robinson Street. Um, and uh, where are they? Are they like two? Are they like flying up Robinson or something? Yes, they are. I mean, that's that's how it's been characterized in the meetings. And okay. my office is on Robinson, so I can tell you. That well, I wouldn't say flying, but I'd say briskly going down the street. I would, um, I would say that that would be, that would probably because of mom's um, schedule. They're more than likely they're probably the drivers are probably trying to make up time because they're behind the schedule, and so 
that's why they're probably moving a little bit faster than the speed limit. But our argument that's is this: our argument is simply this: you've got the boulevard, which is a four-lane street, four-lane road, and you've got a lot of people living there, and it's at the top of the fan district, so people could be there rather than be on a two-lane street with buses. Yeah, I'll two other things real quick. Um, one is, I'm not arguing with you, I'm just, just trying to show, you know, the, I'm hoping that, you know, one of the recommendations from this task force will be a circulator, and I would like to see with Boulevard. Oh, God, yeah. Um, however, I will also say that right, right now, Boulevard is, gets congested quite a bit, and it has some uh, turning restrictions in places, so um, it might involve quite a bit of traffic engineering there. Thank you. <coughs> Any other Comments. Um, I will say this that um, it depends it de because uh, they're, they're the three that runs along Robinson Street, it does serve an important area, and I guess they might run they might route it away on on Robinson Street to, to cut down on time. And like as like Scott said, there might be turning restrictions that would prevent it from accessing Boulevard to get to Maymont Park and whatnot. Mm -hmm. So that's why they use Robinson Street instead. So yeah, it would take um, it would take some engineering, traffic engineer for that. I like to. Um, I extended this meeting a little bit. Sorry. Well, no, I, I, this, this is it, it's this completely is, relevant to me. This is something that's in, involved separate from that. Um, I kind of like to know where you all see this task force in the grand scheme of things because um, you know we haven't seen the the any real input from the other GRTC partners from the counties um, and yet we have we've heard from the MPO Bob Crum at the at the macro subcommittee um, we know that the mayor has been involved in some high-level regional discussions and then we have on July 19th the um, Richmond Connects transportation plan and this public workshop will be at the VDOT Central Office Auditorium from 5.30 to 7.30 p.m. on July 19th. Mayor Jones is scheduled to speak at 6 p.m. and the public workshop will provide you an opportunity to prioritize the guiding principles for the plan and review draft recommendations. And they've got a transportation plan on the Richmond Gov website. Um, I can share the flyer if people want. As I said before, earlier, Victoria Badger presented a multimodal transportation plan to the Land Use Committee and I didn't see anything of really, I mean, it, it had some broad goals, then it showed a map. And, I, you know, I'm just kind of wondering, in the, in the big scheme of things, where we see us on these different levels, especially in regard to input as far as a circular. <coughs> Because I mean, you, you sent me an email showing the examples like the limo service in um, in Orlando, and then um, and then uh, they got the Charm City circulating in Baltimore, and I'm more in favor of the limo model because I personally don't believe uh, there should be you know public-private partnership in public transit. So I don't I'm, I'm, I'm against that altogether. Right. We've had we've had the sort of we've touched on the debate between the private and public. As far as the circulator goes, and I, and I, I understand. I want, I want to have that debate, but I also am wondering, you know, this this is the city council GRTC task force, and yet there's also this Richmond Connects thing that's coming online here. Where is that in reference to us? <laughs> I can't answer that question at this time. I don't have a okay. feel for that conversation. Yeah, and, uh, and you know, obviously, July nineteenth. Some of us are going to be at that other meeting to see what's going on. Yeah. But it, you know, again, we, from my perspective, we have not deviated from our task from day one, and that is just to look for alternatives uh, for transportation using GRTC as a via, as the vehicle, uh, ways to ways to get this thing so that we have a, a functioning transportation system uh, that meets the needs of the community. And again, as I've said all along, I'm looking to any possible model available. Uh, I don't limit it to just one thing or another. Mm -hmm. um, 
I want us to look at the long range, to look at alternatives, which is what one group is doing, but at the same time, we have received a lot of input from citizens talking about the issues they face. Um, and, and probably one of the ones that, that really hits home is the fact that if you live in Fulton and you have a, a doctor's appointment in Churchill, you have to, it takes almost a day to get back and forth, right, wrong, or indifferent. That's what was characterized because of the way the transportation system is set up. Um, and, and again, you know, that's an issue at hand. And that's part of the reason why I think it's important to have the discussion with regards to the day-to-day -day operation and what's going on there. Sure. And then at the same time, focus on that on that next level. Well, you know, we've seen the presentation from Mr. Dowling's URTC about the transit center. And um, what would it mean if this task force came to a, a agree, agreement and a recommendation to City Council that the transfer station actually should be closer to Main Street Station? How would that how would that affect the Richmond Connects plan? I am I am not sure. <clears throat> yeah. You know, again, first of all, that we would have to have a substantial amount of information proving why it would work or why it should be mm -hmm. outside of this area. I mean, it's very clear to me after hearing this presentation today that they have looked at where most of the transfers are occurring. They're occurring in this area that they outlined, and so they made a conscious decision to stay within that, in that space. I think the thing that's disturbing to me when I hear this presentation is, is uh, we talk about the fact that the, the, the positives are um, we're going to get, we're going to clean up Broad Street. Uh, but at the same time, when you start asking about the operational costs, I mean, for me to make a 35, you know, as a business person, for me to make a $35 million expenditure, I better get some efficiencies out of it. And to hear the dialogue that we could be making a $35 million expenditure that is not going to bring us any efficiency, you know, I will have to question that. Mm -hmm. uh, and again, um, you know, part of the dialogue I heard said the reason we didn't come down to 17th or 18th Street is we determined it was inefficient <coughs> based on where the transfers are occurring. So, I mean, I know they're looking at it, but at the end of the day, I think we're going to have to justify it. Well, it, you know, we talked about in the macro committee how we're going to have, we need to make some dramatic changes in local transportation, mm -hmm. and that ideally that includes changing, not 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 abandoning anybody, but changing the ridership of the GRCC in the first place. So when we talk about basing where the transfer station is on current transfers, I, I, you know, I kind of worry about that logic. <clears throat> well, and that's a valid point uh, for conversation. Mm -hmm. We're not going to solve that here today, but at the you know again, I think this is where the long range committee has to say, say you know where are we going with this? Where are where is the ridership going to occur? We we got that information for the first time in our last meeting, and perhaps we need to take a little bit of time at our next meeting uh, and talk about that conversation. Okay. along with the alternatives that we began to explore the, at, at our meeting last time in terms of what alternative transportation uh, systems that may have value. Um, one other point, uh, we had talked about um, having a, a, a presentation by the new GRTC management to this group. Yes. And if it, you know, it's fine to do it by Skype to save on costs. I, I, do we know anything about where we are with that? I have not made the inquiry, but I will okay. see if we can't make that the August meeting. Or do we want to break in August and then come back in September and do it at the September meeting? Well, um, to me, that'd be, that would be kind of pushing it because as far as I know, we haven't extended the task force yet. And we're just about, our time is just about up anyway. Well, let me, let me say, when you talk about the time, I will go back to City Council and ask for an extension. I feel that it's only reasonable that we do it because the committee really didn't get started in earnest 
almost three to four months after we, we began the dialogue uh, because of just the way we had to deal with getting people on the committee or on the task force. I agree with you. Okay. All right. Other comments? Is there there's still spaces available on the task force, correct? Yes. Yes. And, and we should have a full committee in terms of, you know, everyone being here uh, at the next meeting. I hope that's, you know, because of the timing of this meeting, two people couldn't be here today that I was anticipating. But they both had said in advance they couldn't be here. So. And we're hoping to uh, add a new person as well. Yeah. Maybe more. I do have a question. Like, do we have? Is the does this task force actually have to be on some sort of deadline, or is this can be an ongoing, you know, going thing? Because I say I think this this is this would be an ongoing well process. I, I, I hear what you're saying. Yes, I think this could be an ongoing process, but the way this ordinance was set up, it was not to create an ongoing organization. It was to do a study, report, get, bring it back to council, for council to adopt, to receive and adopt, so that we would have some idea of what we should be doing. Okay. okay. That makes sense. Okay. So I have to, basically we have, we're on, we're on times. So. Yes. Okay. But I, but I, as I've said, I have talked to my colleagues on council and told them that because of the slow start, anticipate this committee being extended a little bit yeah. and I did not get any pushback okay yeah no, that's all. all right anything else to be said hearing none thank you all very much look forward to seeing you shortly thank you mm -hmm. thank you thank you